When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was thrown into an uproar. Who is he? The people asked. Matthew 21, 10. During the following week, Jesus' words and actions would profoundly affect the course of history. Amazingly, no written account by an eyewitness exists of the unique life and death of the young preacher from Galilee. Jesus is one of the great question marks of all history. And you might say the whole of Western religious tradition since him has been a fighting over that question mark. The Gospels claim that the high priest Caiaphas called for Jesus' death. 2,000 years later, in 1992, burial boxes were unearthed bearing the name Caiaphas. More startling evidence to support the gospel story. But what can we know with certainty about Jesus and his last days in the holy city? 2,000 years after his crucifixion, Christians still ponder the meaning of Jesus' life and death. It is clear in the present Gospels, which we now have, that Jesus claims to be the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Messiah. But notice all these different titles. I do not think that Jesus claimed any of those things. Why was the man who preached peace crucified? What inspired the belief in his resurrection? These are but a few of the mysteries of the Bible. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets and stone the messengers God has sent you. Matthew 23, 37. So spoke Jesus of this place, according to the New Testament, before he himself would be tried here and condemned to death. For the preceding three years, he had been a preacher in the Galilean countryside, extolling the new kingdom of God that was coming. Word had also spread of his miraculous powers of healing, and his following had been growing steadily. What compelled Jesus to make his first pilgrimage to Jerusalem, the holiest of cities? Was it simply to participate in the Passover? the annual celebration of the Jews' escape from Egyptian bondage? Or did a political agenda, perhaps a revolutionary one, bring him to the center of power? In either event, this would be a fateful week for both Jesus and history to come. Shout for joy, you people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He comes triumphant and victorious, but humble and riding on a donkey. Zechariah 9, 9. He consciously decided to fulfill the prophecy of the prophet Zechariah. So he's quite consciously making something of his entrance in Jerusalem, perhaps sensing that this is the last time, that he is quite consciously seeking a final confrontation with the leaders in the spiritual capital. Either accept me or reject me, this is it, boys. 2,000 years ago, both Latin, Greek, and Hebrew were highly developed written languages. And yet, remarkably, not one word was written about Jesus during his lifetime. Most scholars accept the brief account of Josephus, the noted Jewish historian, as proof that he had in fact lived. 
Josephus reported some 50 years after the crucifixion that a wise man named Jesus had started a movement and had been executed for it by Pontius Pilate. It would be the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, however, written in the first and second centuries, that dramatized the story, giving impetus to the new surging faith called Christianity. To this day, they serve as the main key to the mysteries of the life of Jesus. What you have with the four Gospels are like four powerful, beautiful portraits. The artist interprets. And I think that analogy helps with the Gospels. They are neither simply raw historical narrative, nor are they uh, theological ideas cast into narrative form. I think they are really something, if you like, in between. What we do know as fact, though, is that the first public place Jesus visited in Jerusalem did exist. The Temple Mount had been there for centuries before him and remained for centuries after. Here, religious matters ranging from philosophy to ritual animal sacrifice were conducted alongside business transactions, large and small. It would be here that the charismatic preacher from Nazareth would commit an outrageous act, perhaps the defining moment of his brief life. Jesus went to the temple and began to drive out all those who were buying and selling. He overturned the tables of the money changers, and he then taught the people. It is written in the scriptures that God said, my temple will be called a house of prayer for the people of all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Mark 11, 15. What he really did was destroy the temple symbolically. He did not purify it. He overturned the tables of the money changers, destroying its fiscal basis. Not, of course, in any real sense. The temple went right on in business. Very similar to somebody in the 60s going into a uh, draft office and overturning the cards as an act of, of uh, contempt, opposition to the Vietnam War. You, you don't destroy the draft system by, by tossing out some cards, but symbolically you do it. That's what Jesus was doing for me. By his disruption of the temple, Jesus had posed a real threat to the system, perhaps greater than he knew. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard of this, so they began looking for some way to kill Jesus. They were afraid of him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. Mark 11, 18. Jesus was not arrested uh, when he's in the temple. When he's surrounded by crowds, it was considered too dangerous. It was a time of tension, it's a time when both religious authorities and Roman authorities were nervous. So the stakes were much, much higher at this time and in this place. Jesus left the temple that day without further incident. Most scholars agree with Mark, however, that by his attack on the money changers, he had signed his own death warrant. Early in his ministry, Jesus had been baptized by John, who also preached subversive ideas such as love thine enemy and blessed are the meek. His provocative sermons eventually intimidated the Roman ruler Herod and caused him to have John beheaded. John the Baptist and other spiritual leaders would not create the historic movement Jesus did. What distinguished Jesus and his disciples from the other extraordinary teachers? The answer to these questions and countless others posed by the Gospels are the main concern of the Jesus Seminar. I would say it is the latest of all uh, accounts. It's, it's, it's closest to Luke than any other. Current research and theories, often controversial, are presented by biblical scholars who believe the story of Jesus should be interpreted in historical terms, that understanding the social and political events of his time is vital to solving the mysteries of the New Testament. 
What if somebody invited Jesus and he brought company the person didn't like? What's he going to do with it? A charter member of the seminar, Professor Dominic Crossan, is a former priest. He is also author of several popular books which emphasize the humanity of Jesus. The great mystery is why 2,000 years later, in a definitely electronic age, we are sitting here talking about him. What is there about this peasant that galvanized people to find this person special, special to their lives? Scholars are still seeking to discover what actions taken by and against Jesus during the Holy Passover week happened or could have happened to trigger the religious revolution that followed. During the Roman occupation of Israel, the emperors wisely allowed the Jewish people to continue the worship of their one invisible God. By the time of Jesus, there was little, if any, open resistance by the citizenry to its captors. Neither party wanted any trouble, especially during Passover week when thousands of visitors swelled the coffers of the holy city. On his third day in Jerusalem, Jesus would again go to the temple, where his rebellious acts of the day before prompted hostile questions, some direct, some veiled. Teacher, we know that you tell the truth without worrying about what people think. Tell us, is it against our law to pay taxes to the Roman emperor? Should we pay them or not? If he says, no, don't pay the tax, aha, he's a revolutionary who can be arrested for that. If he does, yes, by all means, pay the tax to Caesar, they might hope that a lot of fellow Jews would become disaffected by this quizzling. But Jesus saw through their trick and answered, why are you trying to trap me? Bring a silver coin and let me see it. They brought him one and he asked, whose face and name are these? The emperors, they answered. So Jesus said, Well then, pay to the emperor what belongs to the emperor, and pay to God what belongs to God. And they were amazed at Jesus. Mark 12, 15. The Gospels do not tell us whether Jesus knew his verbal duels threatened the establishment. They only tell us of their impact. Then the chief priests and the elders met together in the palace of Caiaphas, the high priest, and made plans to arrest Jesus secretly and put him to death. Matthew 26, 3. Unaware of, or perhaps unconcerned with, the wrath of the temple elders, Jesus proceeded to the outskirts of the city. There, according to the Gospel of John, he visited the tomb of his old friend Lazarus, who had died four days earlier. He called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. He came out, his hands and feet wrapped in grave cloths. Untie him, Jesus told them, and let him go. John. 11:43. If bringing Lazarus back from the dead was the most dramatic miracle of Jesus' ministry, it was also his most daring. In John's Gospel, the raising of Lazarus is the final action of Jesus as the last straw. As soon as he does that, the various uh, elite authorities in Jerusalem gather together and say, we have to stop this man. Things are going too far. It's either him or us. This town ain't big enough for both of us. John is the great gospel of irony. And I think the placing of the story of Lazarus right there is a great example of John's irony. It's by raising a man from the dead that Jesus causes himself to be put to death. I do not take the story of Lazarus coming back from the dead physically, literally. It's the symbolism that is important, that Jesus can bring life out of death. That's what I think he was doing. For some biblical scholars, supernatural events such as Jesus walking on water, healing the blind, or 
raising the dead are problematic. There's considerable difficulty for the historian to be able to talk about these miracles. Even if you have eyewitness accounts, you can't say that a miracle probably happened, because if it probably happened, how could it possibly be a miracle? Other scholars, however, believe the miracles described in the Gospels could have occurred. I think that if we bring to the study of the Gospels a historical critical methodology which rules out the possibility of the supernatural a priori, we're not going to get very far in the study of these documents. And I would just appeal for a more holistic approach to these documents, which takes them with more seriousness. How do we know that God cannot act in the historical process? And um, if God can, in fact, act in the historical process, then perhaps we ought to listen to what these documents have to say in that connection. The Gospels tell us that another dramatic, perplexing event took place the day before the Passover meal. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went off to the chief priests in order to betray Jesus to them. They were pleased to hear what he had to say and promised to give him money. Mark 14, 10. The figure of Judas is a, a haunting figure, and uh, why he would have turned on Jesus is, is very mysterious. We don't know what motivated Judas. Was it some greed? Uh, was it disillusionment? Uh, was it something else? But he obviously stands in the Gospels inviting the reader to ask the question, is it I? You know, uh, am I the betrayer? So these are, are powerful narrative uh, uh, dynamics uh, in the Gospel story, the Passion story. The Bible also relates that on this fourth day, Jesus visited an ill man called Simon. There, an unknown woman, without warning, anointed Jesus with an expensive perfume. Her gesture angered his followers. But Jesus said, leave her alone. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body to prepare it ahead of time for burial. Now, I assure you that wherever the gospel is preached all over the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Mark 14, 6. She's the only one who believes that Jesus is going to die, and if she does not anoint him now, she will never anoint him ever. So in one sense, the first Christian, if you will, the first one who really believes in Mark's Gospel is not Peter, and not James and John who keep refusing to accept what Jesus is saying, but that unnamed woman. She is the heroine of Mark's Gospel. You might even say if you wanted to be very controversial and get everyone excited, maybe she wrote Mark's Gospel. When Jesus praised the unknown woman for anointing him before his death, did he know his death would be imminent and violent? The Gospels present Jesus as predicting his arrest and death and resurrection. It seems likely that he had a sense that he was in danger. Given what happened to John the Baptist, and given that he had a different kind of message, but similar in many ways, that he would have foreseen um, a violent end for himself. But for his followers, Jesus was more than a leader. He was also a spiritual force who showed no fear of death. Was he, in their eyes, also revered as the Messiah, their immortal savior? Then the Son of Man will appear, coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Mark 13, 26. Jesus is so quoted in the Gospels prior to his fateful last Passover. Did he mean to represent himself as the actual Messiah? Jesus could not, even if he thought of himself as Messiah in some sense, he could not accept the popular understanding of Messiah because it would be antithetical to everything he stood for. Because the popular understanding of Messiah would be some kind of warrior hero from the house of David who would come and destroy the enemies of Israel. This was the very thing Jesus was opposed to. 
So he could not be a, a messiah in the normal understanding of the term. Why then do the authorities feel so threatened by the presence of Jesus in Jerusalem? Did he know that this Passover meal with his disciples would be his final meal? Two thousand years ago, Jesus prepared to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. Elsewhere in the world at this time, the Chinese were using special bronze mirrors as protection from evil spirits. In France, the Roman conquerors had constructed one of their largest aqueducts. And in Asia, rare imported ivory was used to make horn-shaped drinking cups. The Romans who occupied Israel at the time of Jesus were well aware of the powerful significance of Passover. If a fervor for freedom were to be aroused among the masses, Passover would be the week to ignite it. Here is a peasant who's done something or other, we're not even certain what, but he did something in the temple. In a tinderbox situation, somebody has lit a match. We don't care how many matches, but one match is dangerous enough. When it was evening, Jesus came with the twelve disciples. While they were at the table eating, Jesus said, I tell you that one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. Mark 14, 17. But according to the Gospels, he did not know by whom nor for what reason. What he said next, however, indicated he knew this would be his last Passover meal. Jesus took a piece of bread, gave a prayer of thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. Take it, he said, this is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks to God, and handed it to them, and they all drank from it. Jesus said, this is my blood which is poured out for many, my blood which seals God's covenant. Mark 14, 22. Jesus uses the moment uh, in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup to say this is what's going to happen to him. He's going to give his life, his body and his blood, his very life for the many. The events between the night of the Last Supper and his death the next day would become known as the Passion of Jesus, a brief but agonizing period which would alter history. For nearly 2,000 years now, the faithful and archaeologists alike have attempted to find and document the actual locations where the doomed preacher spent his final momentous hours. Here, on Mount Zion, some believe is the actual place where he observed the Passover meal with his disciples. This southern room has been held by many people to be the room where the, the supper occurred and is often shown to tourists. But in reality, the structure is a crusader rebuilding of a building that was torn down. So the Last Supper could not have been in that room. However, it could have been in that immediate proximity. And I think probably that's about as uh, decisive as we can be at this point on that. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. Matthew 26, 36. And he believed he had prayed at this large stone around which a magnificent memorial was erected in 1920. Paid for by worldwide donations, it is known as the Church of All Nations. Nearby, a grotto has been sanctified as yet another place Jesus went to meditate that night. Returning to the garden, he sees Judas, 
the twelfth disciple who had been missing. In the distance is a crowd carrying clubs. As soon as Judas arrived, he went up to Jesus and said, Teacher, and kissed him. So they arrested Jesus and held him tight. Mark 14, 45. The high priest Caiaphas would interrogate Jesus after witnesses charged him with advocating the destruction of the temple. Have you no answer to the accusation they bring against you? But Jesus kept quiet and would not say a word. Again the high priest questioned him. Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed God? I am, answered Jesus. The high priest tore his robes and said, You heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? They all voted against. He was guilty and should be put to death. Mark 14, 61. Mark presents Jesus as being condemned to death because he claimed to be the Messiah. Son of Man equals Messiah in Mark's mind and so that what's important for Mark is that he was arrested and condemned as Messiah. So I think historically that's correct. He was. But this core question, why Jesus was sentenced to death, is still debated amongst scholars as they attempt to separate poetic license taken by the gospel writers from the actual events of the day. Jesus is condemned for committing a blasphemy, but so far as we can tell, there was no blasphemy committed. It was not a blasphemy to say, I am the Messiah. That would be comparable to me saying, I'm the President of the United States. It might be ridiculous, but it's not a punishable offense. It is clear in the present Gospels, which we now have, that Jesus claims to be the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Messiah. But notice all these different titles. I do not think that Jesus claimed any of those things. Jesus talked about the kingdom of God and was more interested in God and God's kingdom than in himself. If the execution of Jesus was not somehow linked to the temple incident, I have not the faintest idea what brought on Jesus' execution in Jerusalem. The coming kingdom is a threat because it implies that the present kingdom is in fact corrupt. God is going to intervene, though, and with it will go the Jewish leaders who are in cahoots with the Roman administration. So that Jesus is crucified, I think, by threatening the present social order with the uh, judgment of God. What actually transpired between Caiaphas and Jesus may be debated. Whether he was perceived as a major threat to the religious or the political establishment didn't really matter. It was clear he must die. Many scholars and archaeologists agree that this site may once have been the high priest's palace where Jesus was tried and imprisoned overnight. Today the area is enclosed by the Church of St. Peter. In 1990 these caves were accidentally discovered by construction workers about a mile away and may be the Caiaphas family burial chambers. Then, in 1992, an even more sensational discovery, one which reverberated throughout the Western world. These ossuaries, or bone boxes, were uncovered by biblical archaeologists. Several boxes bore an inscription with a form of the name Caiaphas, giving further credence to the gospel story. One box contained the remains of six people, those of a 60-year-old man among them. Some speculate they may be of Caiaphas himself. Was Jesus imprisoned in the high priest's house after his conviction? The Gospels are strangely silent about that night before his sentencing by the Roman prefect. Perhaps the greatest challenge for scholars to understanding what might have happened in the final days of Jesus is interpreting accurately what was happening in the time of the gospel writers themselves.
during the early difficult years of the Christian movement. Mark is writing in the 70s, right after the Roman destruction of Jerusalem, and he is interested not in giving you a journalistic report of what happened 40 years ago to Jesus. He wants to tell you how to behave when you, and more than likely it will happen to you, before you die, end up on trial. The high priest could demand Jesus' death, but the Romans must agree and carry out the sentence. Why did they? It is the Friday of Passover week, Jesus' sixth day in Jerusalem. He is brought before Pontius Pilate, the Roman prefect who will decide his destiny. Are you the king of the Jews, he asked. So you say, answered Jesus. Matthew 27, 11. Anyone, especially of the lower classes, who raises a head above the crowd, does anything that smacks of subversion, endangers a riot, hit them, hit them hard, and come to think of it, crucify them, hang them out where everyone can see them, it'll serve as a warning. Now, as reported by all four Gospels, the dramatic episode that has puzzled scholars throughout the ages. In a gesture recognizing the Passover holiday, Pilate offers the crowd a choice. He will set free one of two doomed men, Jesus, a radical preacher from the Galilee, or Barabbas, a thief and murderer. The so-called Barabbas incident during the trial before Pilate is another mystery because we have no certain proof that the custom of releasing a Jewish prisoner during Passover as a special Passover amnesty was practiced in Palestine at the time. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to ask that Pilate set Barabbas free for them. Pilate spoke again to the crowd. What then do you want me to do with the one you call King of the Jews? And they shouted back, Crucify him. Mark 15, 11. Within the Gospel theology, it's a way of driving home uh, the paradox, the irony of the fact that the people would choose someone who's condemned as a uh, no good, a thief, a robber, uh, and we condemn the very one who is the Messiah, this, this uh, person who is among them as the Son of God. It is a question which lingers to this day. Is the story of Barabbas history or allegory? No further clues to his identity have been uncovered. Pilate wanted to please the crowd, so he set Barabbas free for them. Then he had Jesus whipped and handed him over to be crucified. Mark 15, 15. The route Jesus was forced to walk and his crucifixion has become one of Christianity's most devotional pilgrimages. On Good Friday of Easter week, the faithful retrace the torturous steps he is believed to have taken. From where Pilate sentenced him, to Calvary, where the Roman soldiers would execute him. From all over the world they come, making their way along the Via Dolorosa, the Street of Sorrows, to pay homage at the Stations of the Cross, those sites where the Passion of Jesus is commemorated. Here, Jesus falls the first time. With most Christian holy places in Jerusalem, conjecture, faith, and sometimes science combine to support the possibility of their authenticity. What is important to the devout, however, is that 2,000 years ago, Jesus could have come this way. The way he related to his environment, that he took up very common hopes and fears and expectations but gave them a new twist, a new angle. He doesn't bracket out the political and social issues, but he starts with the, the inside, 
the attitudes, the heart and the spirit, and did that in a way that really grasped people. According to many, the terrible final journey of Jesus with the cross ended here at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the most sacred Christian monument in Jerusalem. Originally begun 300 years after Jesus by Emperor Constantine, a zealous convert to the new religion, its vast spaces enshrine the final five stations of the cross. Here it is said, enclosed in the church, are the remains of the hill of Calvary, where the Gospels all concur Jesus was nailed to the cross. It's one of the, uh, the marvels, I think, of modern archaeology that uh, we can say with fairly good confidence that the site of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, which is now inside the walls of the old city of Jerusalem, uh, is in fact the historical site of the crucifixion of Jesus. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The notice of the accusation against him said, the King of the Jews. They also crucified two thieves with Jesus, one on his right and the other on his left. Mark 15. The Romans would take uh, stakes and drive them through the, uh, the wrist bone uh, rather than through the hands, as in uh, popular imagination, uh, through the wrist bones so that uh, when the person then was hung on the cross, it wouldn't rip out. It, it would be fixed to the cross. At noon, the whole country was covered with darkness, which lasted for three hours. At about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, Eloi, Eloi, lama sakbaktani, which means, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus again gave a loud cry and breathed his last. Matthew 27, 45. The Bible tells us of a wealthy follower who came forward before Pilate to claim the body. Pilate accedes to his wish, although one theory questions this outcome. There are two possibilities with regard to the body of Jesus, leaving aside the Christian stories which, which say what should have been done. One is that the body would have been left on the cross until it was decomposed or eaten by the wild beasts, by dogs or the crows. That is what the Romans would have done left to themselves. Two. If he was buried, are we dealing with some shallow grave? And then we have to imagine the real supreme horror of the crucifixion, the prowling dogs. Nevertheless, most Christians are confident he was buried in a proper tomb. Perhaps the most revered place in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the magnificent tomb of Jesus. Worshippers acknowledge it to be the symbolic burial ground whose proximity to the sign of the cross is meant to intensify the religious experience of the visitor. When Jesus was crucified, his disciples were left without a leader. Yet his ministry survived. What gave it its strength? Teacher, prophet, healer, miracle worker. Jesus had practiced his ministry for approximately three years by the shores of Galilee before venturing into Jerusalem for the Passover. Had he developed a large following by this time or only a modest one? The Gospels are unclear as to how much of a real threat his presence represented to the authorities. The Gospels offer no simple explanation for why the final days of the life of Jesus had to play out as they did. There is no ambiguity, however, as to the meaning of what happened on the Sunday following his burial.
After Jesus rose from death early on Sunday, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had driven out seven demons. She went and told his companions. They were mourning and crying, and when they heard her say that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe her. Mark 16, 9. Jesus soon appears before his apostles and scolds them for not having faith. He then gives his final instruction. Go throughout the whole world and preach the gospel to all people. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16:15. Did Christ literally appear before his disciples, as the Gospels recount? For many Christian scholars today, the resurrection presents the most challenging aspect of the New Testament. If we were to find the body of Jesus in a tomb in Jerusalem today, and it was without any doubt the body of Jesus, would that destroy Christian faith? It certainly would not destroy my Christian faith. What happens to bodies, I leave up to God. Another way to understand it would be in terms of the grief process, that um, it happens, you know, that a lot of times when, when people have lost someone very close to them, they weep and mourn a great deal, they don't eat, they become very fatigued, they can't sleep, and sometimes visions occur in that situation, that they will see the loved person, you know, standing at the foot of their bed or somewhere else you know that they will have an experience of a vision of that person and that and then they feel better they feel hopeful for those who never knew him while he lived what persuaded them to commit to the teachings of Jesus what makes Jesus significant is that after his death his followers said that God had raised him from the dead and that he himself had conquered the major force of evil the, the force of death uh, they convinced other people that Jesus had been raised from d the dead. Christianity then began as a religion that subscribed to the death and resurrection of Jesus rather than the apocalyptic message of Jesus himself. And so if Jesus' followers had not proclaimed his death and resurrection, we wouldn't have Christianity. After the Lord Jesus had talked with them, he was taken up to heaven and sat at the right side of God. Mark 16, 19. Would Jesus' following have grown steadily after his death without the inspirational narratives of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? The impact of the written word on early Christianity cannot be fully measured. What is known, of course, is that the movement would flourish. Then and now, Jesus holds a spiritually meaningful place in the hearts and minds of multitudes of men and women. And I think Jesus' concern was not just the transformation of individuals, but of society, of all the people in their relationships. I don't think he would think in our individualistic terms. It was a transformation of the people. And he suffered with the people, he felt what they felt, he, he struggled as they struggled, he himself suffered at the hands of those who hated him and, and persecuted him to death. You cannot go where I am going, and now I give you another commandment. Love one another. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. John 13, 35. 